The shootings at Kent State University in Ohio of four students in May 1970 were certainly the turning point which made me decide to stay on in America following the collapse of the historical films and try to make an independent film about what was happening in the United States at that time. At first, my idea was to make a dramatized reconstruction of the Chicago trial of Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, Bobby Seale, and the other activists. A friend in Los Angeles, Robin French, who was an executive in an actor's agency, offered me that his company could finance this project with $50,000. Susan Martin, who had been working with me as production manager on the collapsed historical series, offered to produce the film. So we all moved to Los Angeles. But pretty soon after we got there, I realized as I began to meet young people in the process of casting the film, a number of whom had already been arrested for protesting the Vietnam War, that their stories and their experiences were even more vivid uh, and would be more interesting and relevant in a sense even than a verbatim filming of the Chicago trial. And also during this time, I came across the Anti-Communist anti McCarran Act, or the 1950 Internal Security Act, as it was also known. This draconic US legislation provided for the setting up of places of detention, in effect uh, concentration camps, for those accused of subversion by the government or accused of even considering subversion. From this nightmarish piece of legislation, I devised the idea of punishment parks being set up by the US government as a way of dealing both with increased dissidents in the United States and overcrowded prisons, and the need to provide field training for law enforcement officers faced with having to put down growing public protest at the Vietnam War. Punishment Park was filmed in late August and early September 1970. Our location was the El Mirage Dry Lake in the San Bernardino Desert, about 100 miles from Los Angeles. This, we say in the film, is the site of the Bear Mountain National Punishment Park in California. The scenes in the film are cross-cut between the desert, as we follow a group of convicted dissidents carrying out their sentence of having to cross uh, about 60 miles of harsh terrain in the extreme heat to reach the American flag whilst under pursuit from law enforcement officers, and a large military tent on the edge of the park where the next group of dissidents are being judged and sentenced by a civilian emergency tribunal. Amongst the members of the crew were Joan Churchill as the photographer and David Hancock as the art director. Here in this photograph, you can see Joan Churchill with the handheld 16mm camera with which she accomplished one miracle of mobility and improvisation after another. And if you've ever tried hand-holding a 16mm camera, attending to framing and focus, while running over a scrub and rock-covered desert with temperatures soaring into the 40s, well, you'll know what miracles Joan accomplished. In fact, the whole crew were marvellous. Not more than 10, including two, two casting assistants. But we managed to film Punishment Park in just under three weeks, here you see Linda Elbow, continuity, in the foreground. Leaning on the truck is Susan Martin, the producer, and behind you can see Joan Churchill on the camera. The cast were equally as amazing. With a few exceptions, none of them had ever acted before. Uh, in the film, uh, there are basically two categories of performance. Those who are expressing their own opinions, and those who played opposite their own personal convictions. Um, Role-playing, if you, if you like. The activists, whether those in the desert or in the tent, uh, 
were all portrayed by young people living in or around Los Angeles. As I remember, in some cases, we loosely modelled some of their roles on such people as Joan Byers, Abby Hoffman, Tom Hay Hayden, David Dillinger, Bobby Seale and others. But in all cases, it is the actors' own opinions, arguments and convictions which dominate in Punishment Park. In the case of the Conservative forces, the members of the Tribunal and the law enforcement officers, some were expressing their own points of view, and others, as I say, were role-playing. Some of the men playing the police officers had been police officers, for example, but others not at all. And the amazing thing about this film is you cannot tell which is which. I think this says some interesting things about our possibility, even in polarised situations, to be able to see and understand, and even interpret on the screen, an opposing point of view. So those who accuse Punishment Park of polarising opinion, I think really have not fully understood the further dimensions of what happened during the making of this film. The main verbal confrontations in Punishment Park the tribunal scenes, were filmed in a windowless, stiflingly hot military tent. And in order to heighten the reality of the circumstances for the actors, those playing the tribunal members and those the activists did not meet in front of the camera until we began to film their scenes. There were absolutely no rehearsals. Each person prepared beforehand their own background, each worked out their own position and lines of defence or attack. The decision to allow the cast to improvise, and the extent to which this happened, represented a decidedly new step in the direction of my work. I realised that allowing the actors a very large degree of spontaneity and freedom of expression, including the conservative members of the tribunal, would not only strengthen the film, but act as a practical demonstration of my critique against the mass audiovisual media, with their rigid scripts and tight, standardised control over narrative structures and dialogue and editing patterns and so on and so on. But what was most important to me was that in Punishment Park it is ordinary people, the public, who were participating in this challenge, in particular that it was that they were the kind of people and the kind of opinions that you usually do not see or hear represented in and by the mass audiovisual media. When Punishment Park first appeared in the United States at the 1971 New York Film Festival, it was very heavily attacked. The leading film critic for the New York Times wrote, Peter Watkins' Punishment Park is a movie of such blunt, wrong-headed sincerity that you're likely to sit through the first ten hysterical minutes of it before realising that it is essentially the wish-fulfilling dream of a masochist. The same critic added later, an extravagantly paranoid view of what might happen in America within the next five years. And because all literature including futuristic nonsense like this, represents someone's wish-fulfilling dream, I can't help but suspect that Watkins' cautionary fable is really a wildly sincere desire to find his own ultimate punishment. Another American critic wrote, The most offensive of the recent festival films I have seen to date, the British director undoubtedly doesn't realise that he is permitted to make and show here a film that declares the United States a totally fascist state. His achievements, of course, is in making a 90-minute film in the course of which no one voices an original or positive thought. Next, in the process of marginalisation, came the Hollywood Studios, who refused to touch Punishment Park for distribution, for fear, as they frankly told us, of retribution from the federal authorities. 
Despite this, we did manage to find someone to open the film, but either for fear of counter-reaction or because they could find no other cinema that, that would accept to show the film, Punishment Park was opened in an obscure cinema down in the uninhabited financial district of Manhattan. The film opened and closed. It was suddenly pulled off after four days, and we could never find out why. And as for American television, a conference of public broadcasting system producers, in my presence, all asserted that they would never show such a dreadful film on television. And as far as I know, they never have in 30 years. Next, in the marginalization process, we come to the role of the education system. Now, before I continue, I want to, to emphasize that in the United States, there have been a number of film teachers, uh, at least three I'm going to name, Joseph Gomez, Scott MacDonald, and Ken Nolly, all of whom have been very supportive of my work and used a number of my films in their teaching. Joe Gomez has written a book about my work, and Scott MacDonald has written a number of articles about my films, including on his use of the film Punishment Park in the classroom. However, this has not been the general pattern, and my films have been almost as marginally, heavily marginalised in general by film critics around the world as they have been by the mass media. And on my website, I write about the complicity in the media crisis of many of those in media education. To give you an example, in March 1974, at an American state college, following a showing of Punishment Park to students, some of the faculty became very angry. One teacher began calling out, The film is a distortion. You are adolescent, Mr. Watkins. Where have you been all this time? You feel such anguish. We feel so sorry for you. Don't you know that man has always behaved like this since he crawled out of the cave and began using a club? This teacher, a professor of romantic literature, became more and more angry as he then shouted, And what will happen? You and I will be shouting at each other on our other sides of the room, becoming more and more violent, Another teacher admitted that a fantasy of his was that Richard Nixon might seize arbitrary control of the country with the armed forces before his Senate trial. But, the teacher cried out, I would never inflict that fantasy on others. I don't think you should deal with the future like this. You shouldn't talk about the future. You shouldn't inflict others with your feelings about the future. And then a bit later... This teacher walked out of the room. Well, with all due respect to all these people, I think they were missing several rather important points. First, although the idea of punishment parks certainly is a metaphor of the social and political conditions of the United States at the time, very much of the rest of what the film is showing and the basis for the film was happening. From the assaults by a racist police force to the massive aggression against the people of Southeast Asia. And it was very disturbing to see Americans, especially those within the media and the education system and the media, go into a state of complete denial about what was happening in their country. As for the accusation that the film Punishment Park can cause violence, well, this, this is a complex issue, because as I've myself said repeatedly, violent filming structures, especially the monoform, can themselves create violence, aggression, and social divisiveness. I completely believe this. And Punishment Park is filmed with the structure of the monoform. Fast-cut images, strong editorial collisions, dense soundtracks, endless shifting mobility, and so on. But in 1970, when I made Punishment Park, I had not yet 
made an analysis of the problems of the monoform. This analysis, uh, this awareness, did not come to me until some six or seven years later. However, along with and despite the monoform, I think that Punishment Park does have certain important elements which challenge the traditional role of the audiovisual media, including the role of much standardised documentary film form. For example, Punishment Park has an ambiguous narrator, me, who takes a variety of shifting positions which in themselves challenge the role of the godlike narrator used so often on news and so-called informational film. The film crew, us again, also occupy an ambiguous position, both fulfilling the professional mandate to be objective, in quotes, for example, by filming the activists in the desert and not helping them by offering them water and so on, but at the same time, at the end of the film, as, as you will see, challenging the law officers in a subjective reaction to what is actually happening. And also, of course, the film crew, us, in Punishment Park, we have another role, which is that of producing a film, which is itself challenging the, tr the traditional role of the media. And speaking of the media, they love to pretend to themselves and to audiences in general that it is possible to use film to present the truth. In fact, basically, that's all they make out they are ever doing, is presenting the, obje the, is presenting the objective truth. Well, in our film, to help demolish that myth, we filmed a metaphor, the Punishment Park, as though it is actually happening. And this raises a number of questions. First of all, the Punishment Park system per se isn't a reality. It isn't really happening at all, is it? Is it? And as Scott MacDonald has documented, for example, there are, or well, there were, a number of Americans, certainly back in the 1970s, who were persuaded by seeing the film that Punishment Parks actually existed. And the Danish television, when it showed Punishment Park, uh, the Danish press reacted in anger against the US for having such an iniquitous system and then had to retract when they realised that the film was a constructed fiction. Now, quite why the Danish press should have been surprised by this, or the Danish television, I'm not sure, since they should have been aware that all film and all television is constructed, uh, in many senses that every audiovisual act is an act of fiction, if you like, including the evening news. And there's another question. What, on a fundamental level, is the difference between so-called outer reality, which the media claim they show us all the time, and a metaphorical representation of it. If, for example, a filmic metaphor is used to depict a social injustice, then what is more real to the people who are suffering from that injustice? The image of a carefree, happy consumer society given by the passive mass media, or a metaphor which draws attention to that injustice which those people are experiencing. Punishment Park raises all these questions and many more, and also, and perhaps even worse from the point of view of the mass media, it allows young people the possibility to express themselves freely and with force within the framework of an important social metaphor. And I have no doubt that it is for these reasons that Punishment Park has been withheld for so long, especially in the United States. Television remains very afraid of the public voice. And the force of Punishment Park, the force of the young people in the film, who openly challenge the corruption and brutality of the existing system in which we still live, <laughs> 
has undoubtedly led to the 30-year marginalisation of this film. And what of today? What is the relationship of the film Punishment Park to today? There are now two million people locked up in American jails and prisons, a higher percentage of its citizens behind bars than in any other country in the world. There are the brutalities of the American concentration camp at Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, and the sordid US-run prisons in Iraq, as well as the recent discovery of a hitherto unknown American military prison gulag in Afghanistan, in which the inmates, Afghan prisoners, Afghan prisoners of war, are sexually harassed, deprived of sleep, subjected to various degrees of abuse, brutality and humiliation. There is the loss of civil liberties, represented by the recent US Patriot Act, which was passed by Congress before any representatives had read it, and which allows the state to treat dissenting citizens as if they were members of Al-Qaeda. In Britain, the Home Office is proposing to make it an offence to protest outside homes in such a way that causes harassment, alarm or distress to residents. In other words, all protest in residential areas could now be treated as a criminal offence. The British government is also seeking to suggest remedies for websites which include material deemed to cause concern or needless anxiety to others. And with all this and much more happening in our world today, to what degree can the film Punishment Park remain dismissed as a so-called paranoid fantasy? Abby Hoffman, founder of the American Yippie Movement, a defendant in the Chicago 7 trial, was found dead on April the 12th, 1989. His death was later recorded as suicide. He left a note reading, It's too late. We can't win. They've gotten too powerful. Well, I, I, I can certainly understand the meaning and the despair behind that sad message, but I do think it's important for us to try to draw strength from the struggle of activists and so many others and from the capacity of people everywhere to resist. And sometimes when I get depressed by what is happening in the world around us, I try to remember those scenes we filmed in the desert in 1970, and the faces of the young people in Punishment Park, their commitment to another way of living, and the way that they looked at us. <laughs>